This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town in northeast Mississippi called Columbus along the Tom Bigby River. Sometimes I write about the rest of the state. This is an episode with my dear friend, Julie Whitehead, who is also my writing partner. And she has had her book, Hurricane Baby, out. How long now, Julie? A couple of months. Yay. So what's that felt like? It's been very strange. It's like I'm living my normal life, but on a different level. There's there's the shiny part to it that I wrote a book. I really did write a book and it's really selling and people are really talking about it. Cool. And that's not something I thought I'd ever see. Wow. That must be really satisfying. Yes, ma'am. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just so proud of you. This has just been so much fun to watch. Um, So I thought we'd jump in and ask you questions about, uh, you know, writing and the art of writing and all those things that you've done. And um, let's look into some of the the nuts and bolts of writing a book. One of the things I've I've noticed in your writing is you're a noticer. Tell me more about that. How is it that you see so much and that it populates your writing and is so rich? Probably because I grew up watching people as an only child. And my household was a little volatile. Um, My mom and dad fought a lot. And they were pretty strict with me. Uh So I wanted to watch people and figure out what they were going to do before they did it so I could be prepared for it. And that's a habit I've just carried with me. Yeah, it, it, you know, to use the parlance of the day, it was a trauma response when I was a kid. Uh But it turned out to be very good for my writing for and for just dealing with people, just getting an idea of what they were going to do or say before they did. Uh And so I started, when I started writing, I had to, I wanted to explore a lot of psychological issues. So I had my characters do that. Uh They noticed what was going to happen. Or they noticed this or that, or this or that was a foreshadowing, or this or that was a result of what had happened within the book. And that was just something that I did as a matter of course throughout my life that translated into the book. Wow. One thing I've noticed in your book, and I don't know if it was intentional or not, was you use a lot of imagery in Hurricane Baby. I mean, given the nature of the book, and maybe we should give a little background, a a little synopsis of what Hurricane Baby is about. But I noticed that you use imagery that to create this sense of loneliness and ominous, ominous, ominousness, that's the word, in in your book. Tell me more about that. First, first give a brief synopsis of what your book's about. Okay. Hurricane Baby is about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which was about 19 years ago this year. And there are four storylines that go through the book. Each storyline has five short stories through which I show the situations that these families find themselves in as hurricane victims and what the different um, issues they're dealing with. Uh, There's betrayal, there's addiction, there's loss, and there's crisis of faith. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what happens in each storyline. And the characters have to meet those psychological challenges. Sometimes they overcome them and sometimes they don't. And that's, I think, something that people have picked up on the book, that it's not all happy endings. Uh-huh. And... The crux of the book for me is what do you do when there's nothing you can do? Uh Uh-huh. So I guess that's the idea behind the book. Wow. 
so um but back to the ominousness yeah the loneliness and ominous ominous tell me more about that tell me how you set that up in your book and how how do you think it went for you well i wanted i wanted to show that each person was an individual and I wanted each person to have their own story arc, small though it may be. Mm -hmm. And I think one fantasy we have in America is that once you get married, everything's all right as far as emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. You can be very lonely in a marriage. And I think that's a lot of what went on is that these people are suffering alone. For various reasons, Wendy's not going to tell Ray that she slept with Judd McKay. She's just not going to tell him. Mm -hmm. And she makes that decision that she's not going to tell him. And she doesn't tell him for another four years until he asks her outright. Um, Judd makes the decision that he's not going to tell anybody about this trice with Wendy. Uh, Mike makes the decision that he is not going to work for the hospital anymore. He's going to do something to help people more than what he can do at the hospital. And it's not because he thinks God wants him to do it. It's because of his own fear at mm -hmm. losing somebody. But he doesn't tell anybody that. Uh, people I grew up around didn't talk about their problems. They had problems and if you were very intimate with those people, you saw those problems, but nobody talked about problems when I was growing up. There was no sitting around talking about problems in your marriage. There's no sitting around talking about problems with your kids. Uh, it was all very much covered up and in the closet if there was anything like that going on. And it showed me that when we do isolate ourselves through our decisions, dangerous things can happen. There's a lot of suicide in my family. There's a lot of divorce in my family. There's a lot of estrangement in my family over, for various reasons. And it just made me very aware of how people were expected to take care of their own problems and not seek help. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of people I'm talking about. It's the people who aren't going to seek help because they don't know to, they don't know how to, they don't want to, they don't think they should, they think sh they should be able to deal with it themselves. All those situations. Okay. So how did you, uh, let's, let's shift to the more basic level of, of craft and writing. When you got started on this, was this just a series of short stories, or how did this how did this all come together? It started as a novel, a novel concentrating on um, Wendy and Judd. That was what initiated it. Um, the The next part was what happened to Judd when his wife found out about him and Wendy. And what happened to Lee and Rosie, Rosie was Wendy's sister, when they went through a crisis of faith after the hurricane and their, their home was destroyed. So those were three people. They were all very linked together. And it was all one big book. And when I came back to it, I decided to toss the boring parts and pull out the most impactful scenes in the book. And I had already published two of them as short stories. So I thought, let's write these as short stories, but connect them. And so that's how I fell into writing what you've got now. Cool. So, so now, now that, we've kind of understand how you did the framework. 
let's get into the characters. When you did, when you started working on your characters, um, how did you determine who would be the protagonist and who would be the antagonist? And if there's an antagonist, how did you, how did you plot out each of these stories and keep all the characters straight and, and maintain different types of personalities in all of these different um, short stories so that, so that they, they stood alone, but yet they didn't, they still complemented each other. Right. Um, the second time around, I, when I wrote it this time, as a set of short stories, I made a list. When I pulled the stories out of the original manuscript that I wanted to keep, I made a list of them. And then I started, you know, these are going to be in um, the large, the largest amount were Wendy and Judd and Ray's stories. And those pretty much came almost straight out of the original novel manuscript because that uh -huh. was the most prominent storyline in that. Then I decided to I decided to make them all where they didn't know each other because I had I did have it where they all knew each other, and people told me they didn't buy that. Even though that's how Mississippi works. We all know each other down here. Or we mm -hmm. know your mama yeah, or your all, grandmama we... or your third cousin twice removed. Yeah. But people didn't buy it in a book. So I decided to make them where they didn't know each other. And I said, okay, these scenes are going to go, are slotted into this storyline. Mike and Donna Seabrook, the fellow who has the crisis of faith. And these few stories are going to go into James and Lori King who are my new characters for this particular storyline. And then I I had four I had three storylines at first, just those three. Um Wendy and Judd and Ray and Mike and Dinah and James and Lori. And then I had written Tommy Abair into one of the short stories that was published separately. And I decided to keep him. I liked him. I didn't know why, but I liked it. And so I spun out a completely different story for him and his girlfriend, Cindy De La Foss. And that was the one that took the most writing this time around. But I sat down pulling out what I had, and I thought, okay, what scenes do I need to write to make all this work together? And that's when I wrote all that out, and I just wrote each story to that idea. Wow. Wow. So then it comes to dialogue because once you have a character, you have to give him a voice or her a voice. So the internal dialogue and the external dialogue, how did you develop it in such a way that that was differentiated from your other characters? Mostly it was because I, I did work to make the characters different. I made Wendy a lot like my mama, um, where she did not, where she was a tough Southern woman and did not admit weakness, did not admit needing anybody, although she desperately needs Ray. She doesn't mm -hmm. recognize that. She knows she loves him, but she doesn't realize how desperately she needs him. And who was going to take what life handed her and bulldoze through it. That was Wendy. Dinah was a deeply religious woman who felt that there was a purpose to everything. And she hung on to that even when her husband, Mike, lost that train of thought. Um, Ray was pretty much a good old boy. Um, just very stoic. Um, he has his own problems after the hurricane, after because he was a fireman, he was doing search and rescue, but he didn't talk about it. There's no mention, there's like one mention of that in the book. It's when he's in the hotel with Judd, and he says, I can't talk to Wendy about what happened to me during the hurricane. And that's the only mention we get of that. 
And that's that's a character quality. He's not going to talk about that. To anybody. Mm -hmm. And then you get Judd. He, I thought of him as the ultimate salesman. Just this really slick character that could sell shoes to snakes and ice to the Eskimos. Mm -hmm. And I wanted him to be smooth with women in a way that one time, one iteration of this character, I had one of my readers tell me, I can't stand him. He's a womanizer. He's probably done this before Wendy. And he'll probably do it again. And I don't like him. So I had to go back and rework that a little bit. Because I wanted you to feel sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't approve of him, I wanted you to see why what happened happened. And Tommy was just, he wasn't a good old boy like Ray, but he was very much satisfied with the way life was. And so is Cindy in their life. And their lives are upended after the hurricane. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how all that went. James, James came out of Judd's personality, college boy, frat boy, um, not really into self-reflection. He doesn't, he doesn't look at himself and see what he does. He just does what he does. And Lori is tied to her mother and very much wants to move back to live near her mother because she doesn't like their life. In Kenner. Mm -hmm. So that's how all that turned out. Hmm. And as far as the dialogue, I just picked up what I what I heard them say out of my head. Mm -hmm. I hear stories. I don't see them. I hear them. I hear these people talk and I write down what they say. It, that's that's a lot how I write. Is it it just happens. Mm -hmm. And it comes together naturally. And then you go back and work it over and make sure that they know you know what you're doing. <laughs> you hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I felt like with this, the first time around, I did not. I had never written anything this long, this complicated, this odd. To me, it was very odd for me to write this these stories. Well, and how, did I, you, how did you make them all work? When I came back to it, I was in control of the material. How did you how did you make them all work? Were you looking at like a three act structure? Were you it's not a hero's journey? Is it just nonlinear storytelling? How did you how did you make it work? Because it works. Um, I think it's because I kept in mind each story kind of has a a setup, a climax, and a denouement uh -huh. with a cliffhanger. And that's the, that was deliberate. I thought, I need three scenes in each story. I need them all to run together. I don't need to do any time jumping within the stories. Do that outside the stories. And have each one carry through. The only one that really breaks that is the first one. But that one is so much setting characters up that it's it's forgivable. There's a mm -hmm. little more to the first one than, the, than there is to the others. But it was just a situation of writing what happens next. And if I couldn't answer a question of what happened next in one story, I went and answered it in another. So I wrote it non-linearly. Cool. Huh. All right, so now comes the next question, which is, how did you pick the point of view? I mean, if we're going to talk craft, you have to touch point of view. Right. Um, I wanted everybody to have a say. I want everybody to have a point of view. I think the only... No, even Cindy has a point of view. Yeah, I want every character to have a cut at telling their story. Mm -hmm. And so I just made sure that 
each story reveals something about a particular character and continue the action. Mm -hmm. And some, I mean, naturally, I think Wendy's story was going to be from her point of view, the first one. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, when Judd comes back to Hattiesburg and finds out Wendy's pregnant, then it's a case of him having to deal with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do now? What have I done? Yeah. And so that's from his point of view. Uh, it just, whenever I came up with what happened next, I just came up with who it had to be told from. The, the only one, well, the, the one that's the weakest from that standpoint is Rosie in the labor room with Wendy. When Rosie finds out that Judy Ray is not Ray's child. And somebody said, why are you doing that? And I said, well, I want it to be about their relationship as sisters. Mm -hmm. And it causes a big rift. And I wanted to show that. So I had to rewrite it a couple of times to get that across. Because it's not revealing necessarily something we haven't already figured out. I mean, there's a little iffiness about whether or not that baby is Ray's or Judd's. But, you know, Wendy at least believes it's Judd's in that moment. And that's how she acts, the way she acts. And Jack comes in and confirms it, the doctor. Mm -hmm. And so Rosie overhears that and has to deal with that knowledge of our sister. And that there's consequences to that. Okay, so now that we've gotten into more of the, uh, you know, how did you set your protagonist? Yeah, I can't even talk. <laughs> protagonist up, and and how you chose each character and their voice. Once you were done, and how did you choose who your audience was? How did you when you were writing when you were writing this? I know it's kind of general, but. Did you have a particular audience in mind or what were you, how did you, how did you craft it so that it was targeted in that, at a particular group or cross section of, of community? Well, I knew I wasn't writing anything straight. It wasn't a romance. It wasn't a thriller. It wasn't a genre book because I don't, play well with stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I like turning them on their head. If I were going to write a romance, you know, the whole thing would have been how Wendy and Judd finally got, got together in the end from the standpoint of it being happy. Mm -hmm. And you get the idea at the end of their story that that's going to happen. But it's not clear cut and it's not in a happy situation, it's in the aftermath of Ray passing away. Mm -hmm. And Wendy kind of casting around for whatever help she can get. So even if they do get together, they may not make it. Yeah. And you get that feeling from how that story, from how that particular story plays out. So I don't know as I had, I didn't have a genre audience. And therefore, that made it hard to sell. Uh huh. I finally got settled when I was at the W. Chris Lee told me, there's a word for what you do. And I said, what is it? Because I don't know. He said, Southern Gothic. I said, okay. <laughs> he told Who me the that? same thing. Yeah, I said, I said what, what is that? And he told me, and I said, oh, I hate that. Because I really do not like those kind of books. I've yeah. read my share in school, but I really don't like them. And so I fought that label for a little while. Uh huh. But it just seems like that's what comes out when I sit down to write is um, what's not expected. Uh -huh. now, after, after I write it for a little while, people might say, oh, she's going to do so and so. She always does so and so. You know, so later it may be more, become more cliched in my writing. But when I was doing it, I was trying to do the unexpected. Uh -huh. And so I guess 
what I've got is Southern Gothic, and the audience is fans of that, and secondary audience is historical fiction. Because this is something in recent history. But, you know, there's going to come a day when everybody that went through Katrina is dead. Yeah. And Hurricane Baby may can remind people what happened. I mean, there are still people around that remember Camille. Not very many, but yeah. there are. And that's going, looks like that are going to be the best way to show what happened to people. Uh -huh. So I suppose that's part of the audience as well. Not just people who buy books today, but people who read later on. Cool. Well, what are you working on now? Well, it's a novel in three parts. If, at one point, I called it three novellas, but I, I think that's going to be a misnomer. But the, yeah, there's three 100-page sections. And it's about a couple that gets together in the late 60s. They're teenagers, and they're in love. And she gets pregnant. And her her parents are very upset, very angry. They ship her out of town to have the baby and give it up for adoption. The first hundred pages is the story of that from the point of view of the boy. Of the teenage boy that's involved in this. It covers two years of his life from when he's 16 and he moves to Coons, Tennessee, to when he's 18 and he gets drafted. For Vietnam. The second section, second hundred pages, is the story of the girl, Marilyn, who goes from, it covers the time when she starts living in her brother's house, who has adopted a baby. She's staying with them to help them with it in those first couple of years, all the way to when she, um, she, she she turns out to be a, she's an abused housewife after she gets married and then she leaves him and she has an episode where she almost kills herself in Memphis. And then that's the end of that, that time. The last 100 pages is when their daughter is 16 and she finds out she's adopted. She goes and finds them and doesn't like to, to get answers to her questions and doesn't like what she finds out. Uh-huh. So it's several stories within a story. Right. And that seems to be what I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you're good at it. Mom. So, so yeah. you know. But the well, name of it right now is Looking for Home. Okay. Well, that's a good working title. What is your um what is your hope for your for your next book? Um I'd like I'd like for it to go as smoothly as the first one. Um I'd like to have a little bit better better deal maybe. I'm gonna have to amp up my sales of the first one before I'm in line for that. Uh huh. But I just I just want to share my stories at this point. I so, don't know if I have what it takes to get a, a big traditional book contract. Uh huh. I mean, I'm I'm 54 years old. I may be past what they want. I don't know. I haven't tried yet because that's very scary. <laughs> but I think but, I'm satisfied with right now doing the independent publishing with uh -huh. a small press. And just move, maybe move up within that ecosystem uh -huh. where I get on somebody's radar and well, things would, are. Uh, that I would be that nice. Plan at the moment. Well, how can people buy Hurricane Baby? Several different ways. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Barnes and Noble. You can buy it on bookshop.org, which means you're buying it from your local bookstore, even though you're ordering it through a website. You can buy it at Madville Publishing through their site. It's madvillepub.com. 
or there are a few stores that carry it in Mississippi at this point. I think Lemuria may be the main one that carries it. Um, Bookmart and Starkville's going to have it because I'm going to be there in November to sign at um, Bookmart's Christmas Open Showcase. And that's November 10th, 11 to 2. And then there should be some at Author Shop in Hattiesburg because I'm going to be there the 23rd of November signing. Are you coming to Columbus to do Friendly City Books? Have you had a chance? I'd like to. I've talked to her and I sent her, I talked to her at the book festival. She said, I want to do something. Let me clear some other things off my books, off my shelf. And then I'll get back with you. So well, I think I think I may up. hear from her after Welty. Okay, we'll follow up with her, and then let you and I talk. Maybe we can we can do something fun. Okay, sure thing. Uh, maybe we can host a, a a soiree of some sort and, and uh, sweeten the pie. Oh, that would be fun. I think it would be. I think, and we could get some more books signed and sold. That would mm -hmm. that would make me really happy for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, would you send me a bunch of these links so that I can put them in the show notes? Okay, I sure will. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on Tom Bigby Tales and always being so supportive of my podcast and my writing and just our general friendship in 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 out in the writing world that's kind of scary and lonely. I appreciate you so much, and uh, I'm just so grateful you came on my show. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, I'm going to close this out now. Julie's going to send me links. I will put them in the show notes. I will put them in the YouTube show notes as well as the podcast platform show notes. My name is Shannon Evans, and this is the Tom Bigby Tales. Until next time. <laughs>